Good afternoon all. Today we will learn about modern defenses against the control flow hijacking attacks uh, that we learned in uh, uh, week 5 and week 6. Before starting, uh, let's recap about the defense against the buffer overflow attack. DEP, the data execution prevention, is preventing code injection from the attackers, so basically it prevents a shell code injection. Uh, however, attackers can easily bypass this defense by launching return-oriented programming, and by using that, attackers can even call mProtect. We practiced in the, one of the challenges in week 6, and you can add writable privilege on the, uh, uh, no, you can add a executable privilege on the writable memory page, and then the attackers can execute their shell code. So the DEP raises the bar for the exploit. However, the skilled hackers are trained with the ROPs, uh, like you guys, can easily bypass the defense. Next is about stack cookie. By putting a canary value near the control data, such as the return address and the save DBP, yeah, uh, we can uh, detect a buffer overflow attack has happened or not. Yeah. However, this can easily be bypassed by leaking the cookie itself, but we can, if we know the cookie, we can place the cookie uh, right at the position, then like the stack cookie checking will be nullified uh, because the value is correct. And we can also guess the cookie value via sideshow attacks. Uh, the example was a fork. Yeah. So we can either use a sequential leak uh, for leaking the cookie value from the stack, or we can apply the sideshow attack to the fork uh, to guess the uh, stack canary value byte by byte. Yeah. Or we can also uh, launching arbitrary write attacks. Uh, that means like that we can launch buffer overflow or like the uh, uh, not touching the, the canary, but uh, uh, modifying the return address or frame pointer uh, directly. Yeah. And next is ASRL, the randomizing the addresses. And randomizing the addresses uh, will drop the success rate of the attack uh, drastically. But such defense uh, can't hold if there has been the information leak happened uh, via arbitrary read or sequential read vulnerabilities. So if the attackers know about the one of the uh, address from one region, for example, leak the address of the stack or something, then like they can break the answer of the entire stack because the relative uh, offset uh, within the region is uh, fixed. So in summary, uh, all three differences were great when we was born in 2003, 4, 5, but we all know how to defend such naive defenses by launching attacks that we learned in week five and week six. Then the main question is that uh, for those defenses, uh, how can we apply them uh, to our program? So even if like the, it cannot uh, defeat the advanced attacks, uh, it's uh, better than nothing, then how can we apply the, those in our program uh, when we write the code? And such defenses are available as a, mostly as a compilation option. So to make your stack non-executable, you can add a dash z exec stack. I uh, know. Uh, please never add a dash z exec stack to your compilation option. So the default option is like the making your stack non-executable because the uh, program stack uh, does not. Uh, there, there's no reason that to make uh, that as executable. So it was a mistake uh, and uh, the, for the early the like, compiler developers, they uh, let the programs uh, def in default compile the, with these executable stack. So now it is set as a default, uh, not having dash z exec stack. So forget about it, never use this. And then if you see this, remove that from your compilation option. If you do not have like the, uh, some intentional reason for like the executing on the stack. I definitely use like this option to create challenges for you for like the uh, uh, for like a week two, week three, yeah. So we use shellcode, right? Yeah, for those things, like the, I intentionally used uh, like this option to disable the DEP. And for stack cookie, uh, thanks to the modern compiler, the, the default option is like the adding the dash f stack protector. And the definition of the dash f stack protector, you can refer to the manual of the uh, uh, glibc. But uh, as far as I know, like the it applies the stack cookie to the function uh, that has a local buffer uh, sized over 16. 
So size over 16, that threshold is there for re reducing the performance impact of the having the stack protector because the stack protector will place the canary and then having the check to the like the, at the end of the function. So it definitely incurs a little bit of the performance overhead. So to uh, reduce the impact of the performance overhead, like developers are smartly uh, apply the, some of the security policy that like they will only apply uh, stack canary for the buffers uh, size more than 16. But uh, there could be uh, some of the buffer overflow attacks uh, happening from like uh, the buffers uh, less than like uh, 16 bytes. And uh, for those kind of things, uh, if you're warning about that, you can raise the bar by placing app stack protector uh, strong. Uh, this option will enable uh, for the older buffers. Yeah, so, so the functions with the, any kind of the buffers uh, will be applied by this. And if you want to go extreme, then you can apply F stack protector all, and this will uh, place the stack canary regardless if you have a stack uh, local variable or not. So for all functions, um, this option will add the stack pro canary for all. And the performance drawback of like the uh, having a stack protector all is around four percent, and uh, the default option is around one percent. So maybe you would like to gain that 1% performance overhead that you can you should uh, take uh, for the default option. So if you don't like that, then you can remove that with the F no stack protector, but don't do that for the security. So if that is not the secure program, then it's okay, but uh, uh, never use that for the commercial or like in your job. Yeah. And the next is ASRL, and uh, we know that the ASRL without PIE is completely nothing. So because like the, if that is without PIE, then, then we can leak from GOT and override GOT, that's it. Yeah, so attack is easy. And the PIE, yeah, we know that the, we, we, we know that like how to break the security of the PIE, but the, it, requ it definitely requires like additional steps of the leaking the address. Uh, one more step at least yeah to the attackers so the good protect practice is like the always enable the full asrl uh, which means like the please add uh, dash fpie or that and dash pie these two options to your compiler then the all the binary program you generate will be compiled as a full asrl so the if system supports asrl then your binary program will be completely randomized and then uh, attackers uh, will have a little bit more headache than like a partial ASRL. And, but the problem is that uh, all defenses can be used for the sake of the having good security, but uh, all can be defeated by the attackers with the arbitrary read and write capabilities. So GOT leaking, GOT overwriting, and then sequential leaking. So we can we know how to defeat the PIE and then all these like the uh, security mitigations. Then is there any better defenses to such attackers, such powerful attackers, such as uh, uh, attackers with the arbitrary read and write capabilities? Then, uh, because we learned the arbitrary read and write with the example of the former string vulnerabilities, so let's take an example of the former string vulnerabilities for like the defeating about like uh, this kind of the attack. And we can transform a former string variability into either arbitrary read or arbitrary write by using draft as uh, such as a print a percent %s and percent %n uh, respectively. And if we don't use both of them, so to remove the capability of the arbitrary read and arbitrary write. So if you don't use a percent %s and percent %s and percent %n in regular use, then better to remove both of them. Yeah, if we remove both of them, then former string variability cannot perform uh, no arbitrary read, no arbitrary write. But the problem is that uh, we frequently use percent %s, so we cannot remove percent %s. But think about percent %n. Have you ever used percent %n? So I have never used percent %n except for like the uh, before knowing this kind of form of string variability and then like the and for, from now on I have never used uh, actually used uh, like a percent %n for like the yeah. So there's no program that I can like the, the I have not written any kind of program that I can do uh, without percent %n. Yeah. I think so. I think so. So most of us, we, we do not use it, 
But the reason for having this is like the internet all days, like the uh, printing a character requires a, takes a time because CPU and then all the peripherals were too slow. So if you want to, for example, like if you want to implement some of the uh, Super Mario like game, then like the, uh, whenever the, your Mario moves, then your map will move too. In that case, like we need to clear entire screen and redraw everything. But the problem was like the redrawing everything takes like a few seconds, so like human users cannot bear with that. So the one of the smart uh, way to like the uh, updating the screen was like the uh, updating the screen, the character by character or line by line. So it's something like uh, just to get the delta. Uh, that uh, get the, that the, your Mario movement changes the screen, and then only updated those pixels. Yeah, so that that was like a little bit a uh, little bit like faster than like the uh, printing the everything or something. So in doing that, like the they can you, they can check like inside the printf that they can check like the, how many characters they have printed with current line, and then they use that as an information to like adjust uh, some of the uh, ASCII graphics or something. So in an old days, like that, it was useful. But nowadays, we do not use this. So removing this present net could be a good decision for security. But we still have that uh, directive uh, due to the printf standard and the compatibility. So this is a, one of the naive aspects, so block use of the percent n. And the other aspect could be, uh, we can also restrict the printf that takes only the const character pointer as its format string. So the example is like the, uh, so taking this, like a string literal, this is a read-only string literal, the colon and like the com, uh, uh, what is that, double quote uh, percent s, yeah. So it cannot be changed uh, during the runtime. So only takes like uh, this kind of the constructor as a format string, but then not allowing this kind of the dynamic buffer, uh, so changeable, a writable area. So it's something similar to DEP. So DEP, data execution prevention, is for pre preventing injection of the code. And then this is for preventing injection of the format string. So the format string vulnerability and then the tag happens because attackers can inject the percent directives to the format string directly. So this suggestion is like the, um, if we can make a, a format string itself that is read-only, then attackers cannot inject the, to the format string, then the format string vulnerability could go away. But the problem is that like the, this could work in uh, like a, most of the general cases, but that there are some cases that the programmers would like to build the format string at runtime. Yeah, in that case, like the, uh, that kind of the uh, proposes like uh, colliding with the security policy. So uh, this actually like they implemented uh, to the compiler. So uh, this is a sample code that, that contains uh, two vulnerabilities. For example, like the, there's a string copy. It has a, like a buffer overflow vulnerability because the buffer is bigger than the buff the local variable. And then the, there's a printf buff. So there's a form of string vulnerabilities here. And then if we compile this, then our compiler will directly tell that the format string is not a string literal. So that we used like the, not the constant character pointer. So character pointer buffer here. Yeah. So, but the compiler generates a warning here because uh, there could be some of the legitimate use of the, this kind of thing. So compiler will not enforce uh, fixing this kind of the, the error, but uh, it will just emit a warning. And uh, I believe like some of you, and again, uh, maybe like the you guys are like the good developers uh, check like the, all the warnings of the compiler and then removing all all of them before like submitting your homework or something. Then that's a good practice. So, but the, some of the students like just taking care of the errors because uh, if you have an error, uh, you will not get the binary itself. So uh, you take care of the errors uh, carefully. But uh, many of the students are just ignore the warnings. But uh, you should know that uh, what is the price of the ignoring the warning. So if you ignore the warning like this, format string is not a literal or something. So potentially insecure. The compiler tends that directly tells you that uh, this could be insecure code. Yeah. In that case, please do not ignore that and please examine that. And now you know that how to exploit the vulnerability. Then if you find that any kind of the, this kind of code in your like the uh, in your job or like somewhere else, then then you can report that that as a vulnerability uh, with your exploits. Then uh, you may get uh, some of the uh, rewards or like the, uh, get a promotion maybe. Yeah. So please try it. 
And then the, another option uh, for uh, the, uh, like adding the difference to the uh, format string vulnerabilities and the uh, buffer overflow attack is uh, 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 fortify source. So in this example, in the previous slide, I used the option that the U fortify source is something like the on setting the default fortify source because uh, it's a default value is two, I believe. So what it means is like the if I say like a U fortify source to the compiler, then it says like do not add any kind of defense to like the, these kind of functions for the the buffer overflow or like the format string vulnerabilities. And then the, if I mention the D fortify source one, then it will only add a compile time check for like the uh, checking the buffer overflow attack. And if I uh, assert a D fortify source two, then it will also uh, add a runtime check uh, checking for the printf. And let's check uh, what happens in the program binary uh, if we use like the uh, each of the option. So this is the sample code. It has a buffer overflow vulnerability here, and then format string vulnerability here. And uh, I compiled with the U fortify source, and this is the assembly. It does nothing, just call the function. So this program is vulnerable. And if I run this, so if I supply like a long string to trigger the buffer overflow vulnerability, then the program is just set fault. That means that we can uh, exploit that. And also, if we apply like a percent n or like some of the uh, dynamic uh, directives to the printf, then it will just run or crash. Yeah. So there's no defense at all. So recognize that uh, this is the normal, uh, regular, uh, without defense uh, assembly. And uh, if we apply d45 source one, then the difference is that uh, this part has been changed. So it will use, instead of the using string copy at here, it will call, even if we mention it as a string copy, it will automatically call, call a string copy check. And internally, it will check the uh, size of the buffer and then like it limit the, uh, the bytes to be copied uh, to the size of the, this buffer. And then the, at the compilation time, so as a compiler, we can know the size of the buffer because this is a mentioned as a 128. So we can pass the size to the string copy. So basically, it's making a string copy as a string n copy, strncpy, automatically, the secure version. And uh, I believe like I made a mistake. So the, the, there's a discrepancy of the code and the uh, assembly. And I believe like I marked the buffer size as 64. Yeah, the reason is like that these are the arguments. So first and second arguments, and the third argument of the string copy check is the length. So it passes the length 64. So it actually passes the buffer length 64. So please uh, um, disregard the 128 here. So regard this as a 64. Then the code, uh, the assembly will be like passing the, the size of the, the buffer to the string copy check. And internally, it will use this size to detect the buffer overflow attack. But there is a no change in printf at all. Then the result is if I put a long string, then, then it will detect the buffer overflow vulnerability. But for the format string vulnerabilities, if I just uh, apply percent and percent and then like the, it will crash, so it's still attackable. Then what about the D45 source two? Then we now we can see the changes in two places. One is at the string copy check, and the other is at printf check. So not just for the string copy, for the buffer overflow at the runtime, it will also check the uh, printf, right? And then what kind of things that it checks? So it actually passes the number of arguments to EDI. So instead of the passing the format string as an RS, RDI, so it will pass the format string to the second argument, RSI, and then as the first argument, it will pass the number of arguments. So because we use uh, like it's just uh, we applied just one argument to the printf, so that's why it has a one two EDI. So if we use more than any of like a percent directives, then the, it will raise an error, raise it as an error. So for example, if this is two, then it says uh, it has a two arguments. Then printf has a two arguments. Then format string would expect like the one directives because it has a two arguments, then if you use like a two or more percent or, uh, directives or 
if you use a dollar flag to like the uh, refer to the arguments out of this range yeah then that will be like a block so after applying the both uh, the fortify uh, the the fortify source two, so it will apply both the uh, string copy check and then printf check. Then the uh, buffer overflow vulnerability can be detected as similar to the the fortify source one case because it's actually the same defense. And then in the fortify source two, it can also detect the printf uh, misuse. So it will detect the number of present directives, and also like if we use a percent n, then it will automatically block that that kind of the use because it regards that percent n is a malicious use of the printf. So by using these options, uh, uh, placing the D45 source uh, two, we can prevent the buffer overflow vulnerability and also for the uh, former string vulnerabilities. And then the next is about our defense, uh, uh, about the defense against the uh, uh, GOT entries, uh, which is our favorite attack target for arbitrary read and write attacks. So basically, our attack sequence is uh, leak the libc address from GOT, and then the overwrite the GOT to change the function, for example, from printf to system, and then run bin sh, right? So for the code execution, the most essential step is overwriting GOT. That allows attackers to run system, which is non-existing function in the program at all. So because we just leak the uh, address of the puts or printf and then replace that as a system function. And in such a case, what will happen if we block the write access to the GOT? So to run system, we need to overwrite GOT. So in that case, what will happen if we block the write access to GOT? So it's more like the GOT injection prevention, as we did in like the uh, code for the code, code injection prevention with the DEP, and then the format string uh, injection prevention with the checking const character pointer. Uh, in the same manner, uh, we can prevent like an overriding GOT. But right now, the GOT entries are writable because if we resolve the function addresses at runtime in a lazy manner. That means, uh, suppose uh, we use uh, 100 ellipsy functions in the program. Uh, at the start, uh, we do not resolve all such like the 100 function addresses. Uh, we only resolve, uh, we only find the DL resolve function and then put that function address to all GOT. Then the, when we call a function for the first time, then its address will be resolved on demand by calling the DL resolve function. And that's why GOT entries are writable because we will update that on demand, so it should be writable uh, in the programs uh, at the programs uh, lifecycle. But there is no reason that we can make it read only. The way is very simple. At the program's start, we can resolve all the function addresses for the ellipsy functions. So, for example, if we use a 100 ellipsy functions, then resolve all 100 function addresses at the start. This definitely will incur a startup overhead because at the start uh, we need to resolve all the function address. Yeah. But it will completely prevent uh, GOT overriding because after resolving all the addresses and putting them, uh, we can make the region as a read only. So it will not uh, prevent leaking, but it will prevent overriding. Then think about it. Is leaking meaningful if you can override at all? Not at all, right? So maybe if we just block the GOT overriding, then the, we can prevent the control flow hijacking uh, using GOT, okay? And to apply that, so this application is also simple. You can add a linker or a compiler option uh, that is a uh, dash Z rello. Rello means a relocation read only, so making the GOT entries read only. And then dash Z now means that they bind all library functions at the load time. So you sh I don't know why, but the, you should uh, use the both options uh, at the same time. Ah. And then this is the example of the non rello binary. So without that option, uh, it will be compiled like this. And then these are the GOT entries, and these are in the area of the 6010 something. And then that area from VMAP is a readable and writable. So that means that we can apply GOT overwriting for these entries. But if the binary program is compiled with the rello option, relocation read only, 
and these addresses are 600 something, right? And then that area is read-only, not writable at all. So uh, you cannot launch GOT overriding attack without calling mProtect. And we use a GOT overriding for control flow hijacking, then uh, how can you call mProtect at the start? So this might be the good defense for the format string or arbitrary write defense uh, because uh, uh, it will completely make our GOT secure. So in summary, a good defense for now could be uh, having no executable stack, a DEP, uh, placing stack cookie for all, uh, maybe like the reducing the little bit of performance, uh, uh, runtime performance, but they will increase the bar for the attackers. And uh, we can apply full ASRL with the PIE option. And we can apply D45 source 2. It will replace all the string copy printf with the check version. And then it the will also remove like percent %n from printf. And we can also apply the rello and z now yeah, to prevent the GOT operating. So leg is still possible, but we can make it um, read only. Then after applying all these options, uh, if we check uh, our binary program with the pawn check sec, then we will s see like all green lights. Full rello, canary found, stack cookie, DEP, and then ASRL is in the system, and then PIE, and uh, it also applies the Fortify source. And maybe like the a newer version of the pawn tool shows that like the, it's a Fortify source or not, but uh, this one is not. But uh, you can see like the, all the uh, green lights for this. So the, uh, one of the good practice for uh, your security is that like, whenever you write a C or C++ plus program, then please don't forget about like these options to make uh, your program secure. Even if you make a little bit of mistake, then uh, compil compilation options could kill the attacks. And some might be disappointed if the attacks that we have learned uh, is not usable due to such defenses that is available from compilers because defenders just enable a compilation options while you guys are defending with the all the GDB segmentation fault assemblies. Yeah, while you guys are fighting against that, but the defenders can easily defeat the such attacks with the compilation options, then you might be disappointed, but please don't feel like that. We still have many avenues of the attack if all defenses are in, in, not in place at the same time. So if you miss any of the these uh, one of the defense then then you could find the hall and then you can attack that and even if like the defenders applied all these defenses no worries uh, there's a another uh, class of the that, that attacks that we can apply even if like the uh, we apply the all the uh, defenses so for example uh, if there's a executable stack if there's a hole then we can just uh, uh, upload our shellcode, but we don't need to actually care for that. So for non-executable stack, we just do rob. And then stack cookie, yeah. So if it is like a sequential buffer overflow, yeah, it will kill that. But uh, with the arbitrary read and write, we don't care about that. And then full ASRL, sequential read, arbitrary read, arbitrary write, if we have all three, then like the, we don't care about that. So that's how we solved in the challenges in the week six. Yeah, right. And then the, with the D45 source 2, uh, we cannot uh, uh, launch stack buffer overflow, but uh, we can launch buffer overflow for the heap buffers. Yeah. Um, and also with this option, so we cannot use a percent %n in printf, but we can still use a percent %s and percent %p. So we can use a printf as a sequential read or sequential uh, uh, arbitrary read uh, primitives. And also uh, that's z, rello, z now. Uh, full rello so it protects the GOT but uh, there are something similar to GOT in C++ for example the virtual function pointer tables or uh, C uses lots, lots of the callback and function pointers uh, so we can also override uh, those things uh, to launch the control flow hijacking attacks so please don't be disappointing that all the things that, that we learned uh, can be used for like the attacking even if like the, all these defenses are up and to announce uh, some of the administrative stuff, uh, the due date for week six challenges are approaching. So it's on Thursday, so please don't forget that. And uh, you will get 50% points uh, if you submit them after this Thursday, but before next Thursday. And for week seven challenges are due on the June 11th, the, uh, Friday. Uh, 
11.55, uh, right before the midnight, and then there will be no uh, late submission allowed for this because I have to get your grade ready for the, uh, the coming Monday uh, after this due date, that's why. So please keep that in mind and then have fun with the challenges. And uh, today we will not have a tutorial, but uh, we will have a few tutorials for week seven. And uh, on Thursday, we will have a final lecture and uh, I will introduce a little bit of like the advanced attacks and uh, do tutorials for the week seven challenges. Thank you.